see there is a welcome reception uh, today at 7 p.m. Uh, at on the terrace of the Adriatico guest house. Uh, everyone, please come. Uh, we are assured that there will be enough food that nobody will be hungry. So, um, so that's one thing, seven o'clock this evening. Uh, the next thing is a reminder that our schedule tomorrow has changed a bit. Uh, so here it is on the chalkboard here. So the first two have not changed, uh, but there's a coffee break after coal, and then um, the coffee break will only be 30 minutes instead of 45 minutes, and then we'll have Claudius at 11.15, and then 15 minute break and then Jake at 12.15 and that will be it. And then there will be lunch afterwards. Uh, so hopefully we'll be, you know, everybody will be able to get lunch. I think lunch closes at 1.45, so we should be fine. Uh, great. Um, third announcement is uh, our next talk is going to be our one uh, remote talk of the conference. Uh, so what this means is that if you have questions, um, please flag, I guess me, down or maybe Paul. Uh, and what we'll do is we'll run a microphone up to you. We have two microphones uh, and it, the microphones will normally be off, but if you have a question, we'll turn it on. You can ask the question. Um, it will interrupt Peter during his talk or if this is afterwards, it'll just cut in then. Um, and then you can ask your question. Uh, hopefully this will work okay. This is the first and only time we have to try this. So um, we'll see. And if you are uh, instead joining us remotely, then you can just, you know, interrupt and ask questions as normal for, as we're all unfortunately familiar with, uh, with Zoom now. Uh, okay, great. So um, our last talk of the day, we're very pleased to have uh, Peter Kronheimer uh, telling us about algebraic curves in instanton homology. Great, thanks very much, Lenny. Um, it's difficult giving a talk by Zoom and not having audience feedback, so as Lenny said, please um, feel free to shout, interrupt, say something nice. Um, I'm uh, very glad if you participate that way. So I guess amongst the many slices of good fortune that have come my way in my life, um, I want to mention two as relevant to this talk. Um, slice number one is the opportunity I had to begin my doctoral work in, I think, what was a golden age of low dimensional topology. I won't say the golden age because there've been many and there'll be many more and they all run one into the next. But um, the mid 1980s with introduction of gauge theory into topology and Jones polynomial at a different angle um, was certainly a great time to be writing a PhD. Um, the second slice of good fortune after my doctoral work as a postdoc um, my second size of good fortune was to have the opportunity to um, be part of Tom's mathematical journey um, and a collaboration which has um, carried on now for I'm not quite sure how many years. Um, no collaboration here, this is the Institute for Advanced Study, but um, I arrived there in the 1987 as a postdoc, um, also there. Um, was Gordon Amartic, and through Gordon and her partner, Milgenko, I first met Tom, I think, at, um, at dinner at their place. Tom was passing through. Um, Gordon Milgenko lived on the other side of von Neumann Drive, from where I had institute housing. Um, Gordon had told me about this guy, Tom, and the work he'd done um, in the spirit of Cliff Taub stuff. Um, developing gluing and obstruction theory for uh, Yang Mills equations on manifolds with cylindrical ends. Um, that work of Tom's um, in collaboration with Bob Gompf led to the first examples of irreducible simply connected four manifolds that were not algebraic surfaces. Um, the first calculation of any Donaldson invariants that were not of algebraic surfaces. Um, Later, in collaboration with um, John Morgan and Danny Rubin, um, Tom's work led to the first obstructions to embedding surfaces in four manifolds, first new obstructions beyond the case of spheres. Um, that was um, 
obstructions to embedding tori in, in, in four manifolds, genus one. I spent the summer of 1988 and 89 at MSOI, as it was then called in, in Berkeley. And um, that's my first really taught math with Tom, I think in a serious way. And beyond the genus one case, Tom and I talked about um, possibility of obstructions to embedding surfaces of higher genus in four manifolds. Um, you should keep an eye, interestingly, on the Google review ratings for the different mathematical institutes that, um, that come up in this slide. Um, I left MSRI in the summer of 1989, I guess, um, leaving my car with Tom to try and sell. Um, and after a few emails, I got back together with Tom for more prolonged work in, in uh, Oberwolfach. Um, and it was here at Umbervolk, we, we spent a whole month together working, and at the end of that month, I think we had most of the proof of the local Tom conjecture, in particular, for example, Milner's conjecture about the unnodding number of Taurus knots. Um, the project was actually finished up shortly after we left Umbervolk. Um, after that, Tom was at Caltech for a while, and I was at Merton College, Oxford. We visited. We also spent time in New York. Um, and what we were exploring then in the early 90s was um, really an extension of what we did in Oberwolfach, but it kind of took a new, um, took a new flavor. Um, in Caltech, we'd realized that the work we'd done at Oberwolfach should lead slightly more generally to constraints on Dalton and polynomial invariants of four manifolds, relations satisfied by them. Um, and tied up with that should be further constraints on the genus of embedded surfaces in four manifolds. And eventually all this just sort of fell into place rather beautifully and it became um, this paper of about 150 pages uh, inducing basic classes of four folds, the adjunction inequality, which constrains the genus of embedded surfaces, um, all four, four manifolds satisfying a, a simple type condition. This, I think, I mean, this is still the paper that I've written with Tom, which still gives me goosebumps. I think if I look at that paper now, I think um, that was some serious effort that I haven't ever quite done. Um, reproduced in collaboration with Tom. I think that's um, probably the longest paper we also wrote too. Um, so it's that work which is really behind the developments I'm gonna talk about today, um, which we can somehow see as an extension of what we did back then. Um, what were those mathematical themes back in the 90s in that paper? As I said, relations satisfied by Donaldson's polynomial invariant. So, Polynomial invariants of four and a folds, I'm calling, I'm just calling capital Q here, names vary. X is some smooth four and a fold, and alpha one through alpha D are chosen two dimensional homology classes, if you like, in, in X. And to such things, Donaldson associates a, a rational number by sort of counting instantons, as it were. Um, a viewpoint that was sort of present at in our work in the 90s only sort of partially, but um, is perhaps the more modern way to think about these things is to think not directly about the invariance of four manifolds, but the related Fleur homology of three manifolds, the instant on Fleur homology. And to think not about the Donald's invariance, but the operators on Fleur homology. So here Y is a three manifold, alpha is a two dimensional class in Y and alpha defines a endomorphism of the um, instanton Fleur homology. And we can ask for what relations this operator satisfies, in particular, what's its characteristic polynomial, what are its eigenvalues? Um, this was a question which was answered in the important fundamental case by Eugenio Munoz um, in the mid-90s for the case of 
the circle times the Riemann surface. This was with the basic case. Um, Munoz completely identified the ring structure of the instant on homology of, of this three manifold, in particular identifying its operator alpha and its and its properties. What I'm talking about today is not directly the instant on homology of um, three manifolds as it's such, but singular instant on homology. Singular instant on homology associates to a pair, um, Y, a three manifold, and K, a link, associates to it an abelian group, um, I, I have YK, instant on homology. Um, admissible means that the link K has odd winding number in the three manifold with respect to some integer integer class. Um, I'm also going to be talking about instant homology with local coefficients. The straight up instant homology might have Z or rational coefficients. Um, local coefficients on the configuration space makes a slightly more sophisticated gadget. Um, gamma there in the notation here stands for the local coefficient system. And this is a no longer just an abelian group, it's a, um, a module over the ring of Laurent series in some variable, which I'll call tau. Finite Laurent series, I should write. So as I mentioned a couple of slides back, given a two-dimensional homology class, now in this um, singular case, I want to think about Y and K, perhaps as defining an orbital. Technically, I might think of alpha as um, defining something like pairing with two-dimensional orbital cohomology classes. But these two-dimensional classes now define still operators on the singular instanton homology of a pair Y and K. There's another sort of operator in the singular homology case, which um, is important to this talk, which is associated to a point on the link. So given a point P, really just a choice of component of the link, there's an operator delta also acting on the instanton homology. Both of these sorts of operators exist also in the case of local coefficients, gamma. So the instant homology with local coefficients gamma. My construction is a module over the ring of the Laurent series in tau. But as in addition, these commuting operators alpha for the two dimensional homology class chosen there, and an operator delta, one for each component of the, of the link. Um, there's something which in general doesn't make a hold of good sense, but does make good sense in the cases we're going to talk about, which is um, to consider instant homology modulo the constraint that all the deltas are equal, set them all equal, which doesn't do anything if k is already a knot, um, if there's only one delta. But if it's a link, um, just for the sake of this talk and nowhere else, I'll, I'll talk about this as the restricted instant homology. It's going to be a long series module. And it's got now a single operator alpha and a single operator delta, which was any base point on, on, the, on the link. So where does um, singular incident homology come from in its definition? Um, I won't say very much about it at all, but it begins with the study of the representation variety associated with a pair Y and K. These are the homomorphisms or the conjugation homomorphisms from the fundamental group, or if you like, flat connections, from the fundamental group of the complement of the link to, in this case, the group SU2, um, satisfying this condition, which is sometimes called traceless. It's the condition that the meridians at that red curve over there map to things in the conjugacy class of this element of SU2. That's the conjugacy class of, of traceless elements of, of, of SU2. So that's a nice representation variety associated to the pair. Um, 
in this talk, there are two important and closely related examples um, about the simplest examples you can get. Um, here, Zn is ambient three manifold is just S1 times S2. The link K just consists of N parallel strands running in the S1 direction. Um, N is odd for the admissibility condition. Yn is pretty similar, except that what's inside is not a link with n components. It's a knot, because um, as the strands go up, they rotate uh, one click. I'm going to spend most of my time talking about Yn in this talk, but really, secretly, it's Zn, which is somehow the fundamental object here and where most of the math really happens. I mentioned the representation divided of a pair. What is the representation divided in the case of Zn? Um, it consists of two pieces, each of which is a copy of um, something which is familiar in other contexts. It's the two copies of the representation divided of the cross section here, which is the sphere um, with n marked points. If you like an orbifold sphere, um, that representation divided of the orbifold sphere is a described as a modular space of certain parabolic bundles, and it's a very well-studied Fano variety. The representation variety of Zn is then two copies of, of that. So what is instant homology? Um, in this particular context, this, this Zn guy here, you can think of it as starting with the ordinary cohomology of the representation variety, and then in some sense deforming it. Um, the deformation includes adding instanton terms to um, everything in sight. Everything in sight in this case, when you change from the cohomology to the instant homology, actually the underlying abelian group doesn't change. Um, there are no actual differentials for a super model of the complex um, changing the differential, nothing happens. But what, what does change is the operators. So you should really think of this as a deformation of the operators alpha and delta um, to obtain the instant homology from the ordinary cohomology. Um, sorry, here we go. Um, so the cohomology of that representation body or the, the corresponding representation body for the orbital sphere um, has a long history. First three names there are in purple because they were studying really not this orbifold sphere, but the smooth surface of genus G. Um, in the context of gauge theory, the seminal work there was by Thier and Bott. Some of the first results about the structure of the cohomology ring were obtained by Thaddeus and by Cohen. Um, there are many other names that could be included there. Um, in the context of this orbifold two sphere, um, Something like a tier bot result was obtained by Hans Bowden. Um, the cohomology ring was studied by Jonathan Weitzman. Um, and most relevantly to this talk um, by Ethan Street in his 2012 PhD. Um, a theme that appears prominently in some of this, in particular the Earl Kerman paper, is the description of the cohomology um, as presented by generators and relations, that the generators are the tier bot generators, but the relations are sometimes talked about as the Mumford relations coming from index theory and algebraic geometry. The instant homology, uh, in the case of a smooth surface of genus G, as I mentioned before, was uh, analyzed successfully by Munoz. Um, Ethan Street's thesis analyzed the, this orbifold case, this case of Zn exactly. So the instant homology of Zn was entirely determined by, by Street. Um, a generalization from, and a partial calculation of the ring was obtained by uh, Yi Shi and Bo Yu Zhang um, for the case of an orbital of, of, of higher genus. In this talk, I want to describe a deformation. That you ought to think of local coefficients as a, just another deformation of the instant homology, um, a further deformation. Again, you shouldn't really think of the underlying module of the group as changing really, except extend the coefficients to this ring of long series. What changes now is the operators. 
So that's really what we want to understand, how these operators deform and how do their characteristic polynomials change. Um, that's the case of Zn, the story for Yn, which is what I'm gonna show in the next few slides. You should think of it as being essentially the same. Um, the beginning point isn't quite the cohomology ring of Zn anymore. Um, it's not really the cohomology ring of instant homology of, of, of representation divided Yn in our context. The best way to think about it is just to take the ordinary cohomology of that representation variety and do this restricted thing, just kind of set all the deltas equal. Um, that becomes something rather simple. The instant homology can be entirely described using Ethan Street's thesis. And what I want to talk about today is, is the deformation with local coefficients. So what is this gadget over here? Um, it's some module for a ring, as I said, ring of lower series in tau, that's the local coefficients, with two interesting commuting operators, alpha and delta. And my talk wants to answer the questions, do what relations are satisfied by alpha and delta? In particular, as they're commuting operators, they have uh, simultaneous eigenvalues. What are those eigenvalues for alpha and delta as a pair? So because we're working over the law series, I could think of tau as just a, a, a real or complex parameter if I want, in which case, as I vary tau, I've just, the instant homology just some, some complex vector space of fixed dimension. Alpha and delta just matrices of operators on that finite dimensional vector space commuting, um, but depending on tau as a parameter. And I can ask what the eigenvalues of alpha and delta are as functions of tau, just to say different way of looking at the same thing. So next several slides are going to show you the answer. Um, beginning with a case which is sort of trivial, but still somehow non-trivial when you draw these pictures. The instant homology of Yn, remember that's three strands running up S1 times S2, three strands and just with one click of rotation. So it's a knot in S1 times S2 with winding number three. Um, what is the cohomology of the representation value? The, the representation value is just two points. Um, the operator alpha and delta are both zero on the, on the cohomology. Um, and um, a simultaneous eigenvalues of alpha and delta. Th this graph here, this is the alpha axis. I hope you can see the alpha label there and the delta label there. This point here is the simultaneous eigenvalues of alpha and delta. Um, but thinking of this as a module, I can think of um, this as a sheaf on the plane. Um, in which case, it's two copies of the skyscraper sheaf located at zero, zero. And that's the cohomology of the representation value. According to Ethan Street's calculation, what happens when you take the instant anomology? That's a deformation of this picture. Those two copies of the skyscraper sheaf, they just kind of move. Um, and there they are now with eigenvalues of alpha being one and minus one and eigenvalue of delta still being zero. So two skyscraper sheaves at those two points. Already in this very simple case, it's quite interesting to ask what happens in the local coefficient system, which you vary tau. Um, the answer is that those eigenvalues move in the plane and they move along these curves. Um, that's actually some smooth rational quartic curve in the plane. And as I vary tau, and those green dots, what, that's what happens when tau is 0 0.6. Tau equals one is trivial coefficients. That's where the pink dots are. And as you vary tau away from one, the eigenvalues move uh, along these um, algebraic curves. Let's draw the picture. It gets a bit more interesting for n equals five, um, five strands. Again, the eigenvalues of alpha and delta just to the ordinary cohomology are just zero. Um, so everything's at the origin there. There's two copies of that blob at the origin, but that blob is no longer a skyscraper sheaf. It got two copies of what? Two copies of the fat point at zero, zero. The fat point, um, first infinitesimal neighborhood of the origin. Um, it's a subscheme of the plane of, of length three. Two copies of that, dimension six, sitting there at the origin. That's just the ordinary cohomology ring. 
in this sort of restricted version, setting five deltas all equal. Street's thesis tells us what happens when um, we deform to the instant homology. And this is what happens. The eigenvalues of alpha now become the odd integers, three, one, minus one, and minus three. At three and minus three, there's just a skyscraper sheaf here. The eigenspace at this point is two-dimensional. Um, it's not two copies of the skyscraper sheaf. It's a subscheme of the plane of length two. It's two points that have coalesced um, in the direction of the, the delta axis there. The total length here is, is six, one plus two plus two plus one. So that blob of size six has just become these six guts. That's uh, Street's thesis. What happens when we introduce the local coefficients is that these eigenvalues move along now a more interesting algebraic curve. That's what happens when um, tau, I think, is 0 0.7 in this picture. The six blobs will become the six distinct um, eigenvalue pairs in the plane. N equals seven. Um, Ordinary cohomology is two copies of the second international neighborhood of zero, zero. Um, this is how it breaks up, just according to street, the eigenvalues now odd integers in the instant cohomology. Um, these are subschemes of the plane of length one, two, three. Um, and the eigenvalues of alpha are plus or minus one, three, and five. What's happening here is a little bit more interesting. It's not three points having coalesced parallel to the delta axis. It's some curvilinear subscheme of the plane. Three points have actually sort of coalesced along um, the parabola at that point locally. Um, this is what happens when we introduce local coefficients. Again, the eigenvalues move along these interesting algebraic curves. So that, that blue curve there, that algebraic curve, that's the curve of relation, just describing the relation between alpha and delta. Some polynomial in alpha and delta is zero. Um, what is that polynomial in alpha and delta? Um, this is a small zoom in of the rather large mathematical output which describes what that polynomial is. It's got degree 24 in alpha and delta, and it looks a mess. I mean, I think any polynomial degree 24 is likely to be a mess. It's just an irreducible polynomial. Um, what's it gonna look like? Well, it's gonna look something like this. But um, the calculation of this thing is um, kind of what I want to explain a bit for um, the main part of this talk. Very briefly, this is what happens in n equals nine. It looks kind of similar. Eigenvalues of alpha now go from seven down to minus seven. Here's the case n equals 11. The equation of this blue curve is now truly horrendous. It's got um, degree 60. Um, that number there is the coefficient of alpha to 51 times delta to the nine. Um, again, it's some irreducible polynomial of degree 60 in two variables, alpha and delta. As an equation in alpha delta, it's sort of quite scary, but there's actually something which is, you, know, you should think of tau, you know, tau is a coordinate on this, on this curve, it's a function, actually a two-valued function on this blue curve, describing how these eigenvalue points, these green points move. You should really think of the curve in three space where the third coordinate is tau, and that blue curve is the projection to the alpha delta plane for getting the tau coordinate. Um, if you take a space curve and project it to the plane, um, the equation gets a whole lot more complicated. And that's kind of somehow why the polynomial alpha delta is so horrific. Um, this is the next case up, n equals 13, a partial picture of the curve, but, but now in three space. Um, the coordinates are slightly different, but basically this is in three space with coordinates tau delta and alpha describing this algebraic curve. So if n equals 13, this is the object we kind of really want to study this instant on homology with local coefficients. And what it is, 
to say things another way, it's just the ring of regular functions on this algebraic curve in, in three space. So to describe this instant non cohomology we need to understand what is this curve, what are its equations, what characterizes it. Um, so how are these equations computed? In principle, the equations of these curves, they define using instant on cohomology. So the answer depends on calculating some instantons, which seems impractical. Um, but um, essentially, as in Monozzi's calculation, or the second version of Monozzi's calculation, we can eventually obtain the answer only by understanding the simplest non-flat instantons, the instantons of smallest non-zero action. So how, how does this happen? Um, as we very tower, we just get some bunch of points in the plane, the alpha delta plane. Um, here, in the case uh, n equals 11, um, we actually get 15 points in, in, in the alpha delta plane. I, I want to describe what those points are. I'm only really describing a point in the Hilbert scheme, the Hilbert scheme of 15 tuples of points in, um, in C2. The ordinary cohomology, um, here's just a, a blob um, at the origin. I can also think of that as an element of, of, of the Hilbert scheme. So really what I want to describe these 15 points is some coordinates on the Hilbert scheme in which to describe where these points are. Um, they start off at the interesting neighborhood or bundled together here. Um, and here they're deformed as we vary. <clears throat> well, the deformation there is the combination of the instant on deformation and then the local coefficient def deformation. So we want affine coordinates on some Zariski open neighborhood of this point um, in the Hilbert scheme. And there's a neat way to do this with determinantal variety. So S here is, is relevant to this particular case of n equals 11. S, S is a matrix of here with just variables Sij. It's got um, dimensions five by six. The simplest sort of thing I can consider in this case and call a determinantal variety is the locus of such matrices which do not have full length. So general rank would be five, but let's consider the variety of mat such matrices S where the rank is four or less. Um, that turns out to be some um, co-dimension two locus in the space of matrices S. Um, but I now want to do something relevant to the plane. Um, let's consider that the entries of this matrix are inhomogeneous linear functions of degree one in some variable uppercase X and uppercase Y with some coefficients, which I'm just gonna think of the coefficients A, B, C as fixed and think of varying x, y as coordinates of a point in the plane. And as I vary the point x, y in the plane, I can ask, when is this matrix not of full length? Which values of x and y? Again, that's co-dimension two, so it's gonna be a, set of, a finite set of points, capital X, capital Y, in, in, in the plane. Um, not having full length, is the same as saying that the minors of this matrix, the five by five minors are all zero. Um, so it's defined by these polynomial conditions. As such, I can really think of this configuration of 15 points X, Y as that's more generally an element of the Hilbert scheme of, of 15 tuples of points, um, subschemes of the plane of, um, of length 15. So that's the problem there in that box. And you know, given thinking A, B, and C is fixed, find the points X and Y in the plane, say C2, such that the rank is, is less than five. And as I said, it's the equivalent to the vanishing of some polynomials. Polynomials would become now polynomials in X and Y. I said I want to think of A, B, and C as fixed, but I, here I'm taking a very slightly different point of view. Let's, let's think about S as first of all, S1, which is the degree one part in X and Y. And then S0, which is the constant part in X and Y. 
let's think about A and B now is fixed. Um, and let's vary the coefficients C. So for each choice of A, B, and C, I get some configuration of points in the plane, say 15 points. And as I vary C, these points will, will move around in the plane. Um, the minors of S1 itself, when all the Cs are zero, that turns out just to be, at least for generic choice of A's and B's, that, that's just the maximal ideal fifth power. That's just the, the blob at the origin, um, the fourth infinitesimal neighborhood of zero. Um, I add these zeroth order terms, that the Cij, and I get a general element in some open neighborhood in the Hilbert scheme. This is, here it is pictorial. This is the vanishing of the minors of the homogeneous matrix. This is the vanishing of the minors of S1 plus S0. And as I vary S0, these points will, will move around. So as it turns out, there's a very simple way to describe what's going on for Y11, for example, or any, any N um, in, in exactly these terms. So this is really a special instance of the general story I was talking about before. This large piece here with alphas and deltas, think of that as S1. Capital delta is actually just lowercase delta divided by two, just to make the type setting a little bit more compact. This is a matrix of linear forms in two variables. They used to be X and Y, and now they're just alpha and delta. This is a term which is zeroth order. This is the S0, zeroth order in alpha and delta. It's a bunch of scalars in the coefficient ring, non series in tau. The, these matrices may look a bit scary, but you can kind of see the pattern. This is a two band diagonal matrix. Um, the coefficients here, 19, 15, 11, 7, they just move in a simple geometric series. I guess arithmetic progression, not geometric. Um, the same with, with these coefficients. Here, there's some weights tower at the front, but this is a three band sort of contra diagonal matrix. Again, the coefficients just move in a little arithmetic progression here. Um, these matrices aren't very hard to write down. Um, and they just completely describe what's going on for the instant on cohomology with local coefficients. I've got this tau dependent S0. The locus where S does not have full rank will be some bunch of points in the alpha delta plane. As I vary tau, these points will move around exactly as those green points move around, moving along those blue curves in, in the previous pictures. Another way to say that is that this instant non cohomology ring with local coefficients, it's the ring of functions again on some curve in, in three space. It's the curve defined by the vanishing of the five by five minors of that five by six matrix with coordinates tau, alpha, and delta. I want to just pause here to emphasize how surprising this result is. Um, in Munoz's work and in Ethan Street's work, um, the instant on cohomology of these operators alpha and delta are completely described for closely related situations to this. But they're only described by some um, recursive formula to, to compute these relations. There's some, there's some recursion, um, and it throws these things out one by one. This is a very compact and closed form um, for uh, something which is essentially a generalization of, of Ethan Street's calculation. But where do these matrices actually come from? What are the ingredients of this calculation? I don't have much time to talk about this, but the matrix S1 of linear forms, um, that really involves the ordinary cohomology of the representation variety of, of Zn. And what it derives from is an explicit presentation of the ordinary cohomology. Um, the cohomology is described by these Mumford relations, um, but in this particular case of the Oberfold sphere, um, there's an explicit product formula for these Mumford relations. Um, 
I don't call these the, the roof correlations for the overflowed sphere. Um, as an explicit product of, of, um, of linear forms, it's from that that you can write down very easily the matrix S1 of uh, essentially syzygies for these relations in the ordinary cohomology ring. As I said earlier, this is really parallel to work of Menard's. Um, the matrix S0, that's the instanton deformation and the local coefficient deformation. Um, by a small miracle of, the, of this algebraic geometry and this, this, these coordinates on, on the Hilbert scheme, you can completely understand S0 only if you, only if you understand just the, the next lowest term in the relations. And that just depends on the instant non modulus spaces of smallest non-zero action. So the, those were just the ingredients of, of the calculation which led to this very explicit form of, of the description of the instant non cohomology ring. Um, I should say a description of my collaboration with Tom that this kind of took a long time. I mean, this was pandemic work and there was kind of months of effort for the case of n equals five, which we um, really studied very explicitly using the description of the representation variety as CP2 blown up at five points. Um, understanding explicit instantons by understanding rational curves in um, in that Farnham manifold, um, big mathematical calculation with large matrices, and finally finding the characteristic polynomials of, of alpha and delta. Um, to go further, and when we've done n equals five, I think I was ready to give up. Um, and Tom said we should just, you know, we done more than that in the 90s um, with um, that 150 page paper. We ought to be able to do more um, in 2020, 2021. Um, eventually we found for general N a description of the operators alpha and delta as functions of tau, um, but only via um, a rather elaborate recursive calculation sort of similar to Ethan's recursive calculation in some ways and, and that of Munoz in his, in his first paper on S1 times sigma G. Um, it was, I think, a surprise to both of us that the final answer could actually be written down in such a, a small closed form uh, by these uh, syzygy descriptions of the, uh, the coordinates on, on the Hilbert scheme. Um, There were um, intended applications for this along the way, which we haven't returned to. Um, having done the case n equals five a long time ago, um, our motivation was to describe the um, framed singular instant cohomology of torus knots, in particular five n torus knots, um, starting with this uh, zn and yn um, and applying some surgery triangles. That's something we succeeded in doing for T54 and T56. Um, it's something we haven't yet returned to for a uh, higher end, um, but that's certainly the intended application originally. I think at this point, the intent application is just to look at, at the beautiful the beautiful answers. Um, so I'm happy to um, answer any questions, but um, that's the end of my talk for now. And, and thank you very much for for listening and again i'm sorry i'm not there in person but i very much enjoyed being there over zoom thank you thanks peter uh are there questions for peter don't give him a bad impression of our our people here <laughs> <laughs> Jake. Sorry, this is a dumb question, but can you remind me what um, the framed in the, which one is the framed instanton uh, homology? 
Yes. <laughs> so dance actually isn't that simple. But when we first started doing this, the famed instant homology was for us was um, where you take this knot YK um, and you connect some with um, a theta graph in the in the in the three sphere. Um, and the local coefficient system should involve three variables, tau one, tau two, tau three, attached to the three arcs of the theta graph and um, maybe a variable tau associated on, to, to the knot in, in, in Y. Um, that, the problem with that guy there, having a, that graph there is that we don't really know how to do that except with um, Z mod two coefficients. So originally these cohomology calculations were all with Z mod two coefficients, which was very scary indeed. Um, an alternative is to take, connect some not with a the theta graph, but with um, essentially the Z3 guy, three strands in, in S1 times S2. Um, whichever way you look at it, um, perhaps a more fundamental viewpoint is um, in um, the work of Ali Damien and Chris Scarudo. So you could think of um, these calculations as relevant to um, a calculation of what they might call the, the equivariant version of um, single instant homology for, for knots um, in, in S3, for example, such as the Tor's knot. Peter. So what, what knots do you know this um, homology for now? Um, I'm not sure what the complete list is. I mean, we, we, um, we know it for the three N torus knots. We know it for the five, four, and I think the five, six torus knot. Um, we know it for the knot um, seven four. I don't mean the torus knot seven four. I mean the knot seven four in, in the knot tables, um, um, and a, a few other small knots which you can um, make. And for example, I think the the um, I think we've got the twist knots at some point. Um, the motivation originally came from um, the hope that we could use this, for example, for the knot 74 to um, detect the difference between clasp number and uh, slice genus for um, connected sums of many copies of a knot. Um, it turns out we couldn't do that in the way we wanted it. So, you know, Yuhaj um, and uh, Zemke. Um, found a difference for the 7-4 knot. Um, and the sorts of results they obtained using Upsilon, we could sort of reproduce using um, the single instant homology, that, that similar to the Upsilon calculation. Um, what we weren't able to do was um, um, what Damien Scaduda were able to do, which is distinguish the slice genus from the positive class number for the 7 that's something we wanted to do for the seven four knot, um, and um, the um, I think the motivation is still to try and compute some more interesting knots and see whether anything more interesting starts to happen um, in this single instant case. The um, Double points, introducing double points in some embedded surface or corresponds to multiplication by one element of this coefficient ring and adding genus corresponds to multiplication by some other. And if the module you're looking at is some interesting thing like um, a sheaf on some algebraic curve of large genus, then multiplication by two different elements is um, something where there's interesting relations which are go, go beyond just uh, integer 
orders are vanishing at a single point for some time. But um, I think that that's still the motivation in part for, for the calculation, but um, just in small, not so far. Another question? Is there an explicit description of the matrix for any odd n? So here, I guess, is for n equals to 11. And how about... Oh, yeah. I mean, it's... Um, it's... Uh, you know, said to the same thing. I mean, so as you... If you write n, which in this case is 11, as 2k plus 1, so k is 5, there's just some matrix S. Instead of being 5 by 6, it's k by k plus 1. It's still two bands. Um, these coefficients just sort of follow the same little arithmetic progression in steps of four, just continues a bit longer and starts at a slightly different place. Um, so if you gaze at this matrix long enough, um, you ought to be able to guess what it looks like for n equals 15 or 19 or, or 101. Um, it's, you just kind of continue the pattern, make, make the matrices just, just bigger. Is that? Yeah, so does this mean for any n, so the i of y gamma is already uh, explicitly computed? It's com explicitly computed in the sense that it's um, the locus where the um, rank of s is is not full, uh, right. where S is a very explicit uh, matrix. It, it's given explicitly by the vanishing of the minors, the M by M minors of a certain M plus one by M ma matrix here. Um, Thank you. Other questions? Ah, Tom, you want to say something? Yeah. Well, <coughs> I won't ask any questions because I probably know what he's talking about. <laughs> um, but of course, unfortunately, since Peter's not here, I, I don't have a chance to thank him in, you know, um, in person in front of other people. But I think this is a, as good, as close as it gets. But, you know, it's been a, an amazing ride. And uh, um, I'm amazed that it still keeps going. And it's fun. And it's really, I mean, you can't get luckier than having a collaborator like Peter. So that's all I want to say. Thanks. Anyone want to top that? <laughs> <laughs>